Hello everyone. First of all, a very happy new year to all of you. And it's great to see everyone back in 2020 with a fresh new series under the NZEP uh, knowledge series webinar. Uh, we are very excited to be back in the new year with a lot of new uh, content that will come to you in the subsequent uh, webinars. Uh, as always, I'd like to first uh, introduce to everyone who is new, uh, uh, logged in today, what is the series about? This is a platform for industry experts uh, to share their knowledge, expertise, and showcase projects, products, technology, and innovative ideas to grow engagements for net zero energy buildings in India. This uh, initiative is supported by the METRI program, that is Market uh, Integration and Transformation for Energy Efficiency. You can know more about the program on our website, uh, METRI at edsglobal.com. This is funded uh, by EDS, uh, USA, and uh, implemented by EDS. Myself, I'm Deepa. I'm an architect and a green building consultant at EDS and I will be the session moderator today. So today, as it goes by the title, we have an exemplary building that we're going to learn more about called Avsara Academy. This project is an example of contemporary building that truly integrates climate responsive design principles making this a high performance building. A little introduction uh, before we jump into the actual presentation so it gives a context. This 1,20,000 square feet building has been uh, recently completed in 2016. It is located near Pune, which uh, enjoys a relatively comfortable climate compared to Mumbai. With a site like this, as you can see in this picture, where just about anything could be built. We are intrigued by the way this project has taken shape and with such a low energy footprint. And thus the provided uh, solar hot water and rooftop for PV is actually um, sufficient to meet the energy requirements, making this a truly high performing net zero energy building by design. So talking to us about the process today is the architect himself, Samuel Barclay, joining us on this webinar from Mumbai. Sam practiced in Los Angeles with Studio Works Architects before moving to India in 2006 to work with Studio Mumbai and founded Case Design in 2013. In addition to this, in the design and construction of architecture projects. He has also worked on furniture, interiors, and exhibitions, and founded the brand Case Goods in 2015. We'll hear more about this project from uh, Sam himself. Uh, I welcome you, uh, Sam, on this webinar, and over to you. Thank you very much. Can, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so uh, Deepa, thank you for the invitation to participate today. Uh, so as, uh, as Deepa mentioned, the project we'll be talking about today is the Avsara Academy. Uh, it's located um, just outside of uh, Pune in a small valley uh, near a village called Lavale. Uh, uh, the first building, as mentioned, was completed in 2006, but the campus itself is still in progress. So it's a, it's a four-acre campus. It's a residential school for young women uh, that's been uh, established as part of an NGO. Uh, all of the buildings are funded by uh, corporate and individual donors, so it's quite a low-budget project. But before we got into that, I wanted to start with um a little bit about our practice 
So um, I came to Mumbai in 2006 and I worked for quite a while with Studio Mumbai. Um, I left there in 2013 and started Case Design. And our studio is made up of not only uh, architects and designers, but we also produce furniture, uh, lights, we do exhibitions, residential interiors, and it's very much a craft space uh, studio. We do um, a, a lot of things that are uh, both high tech and uh, sort of cutting edge in the way that we tend to think about them, but we also rely heavily on the collaboration with artisans and, and craftspeople. And so part of the joy for me in practicing in a place like Mumbai is that we have access to the most contemporary technology uh, in terms of simulation, in terms of uh, rapid prototyping and digital production but we also have the kind of knowledge, materials, and expertise that have been around for, for thousands of years. Um, <clears throat> this is some of the furniture that we produce. Uh, and again, the, the detailing and the materiality are, are really important to us. So a lot of the things that we work on, we care very much and very deeply about how they're put together, the kind of materials that, that are used. Um, and so for us, the, the idea of uh, a well-crafted building doesn't necessarily mean that it's an exclusive uh, uh, product, something that has to be very expensive, but just the, that the attention and thoughtfulness uh, with how these things uh, come together is, is a really critical part of our, um, uh, our practice. So the, as I said, a lot of the people that we work with, a lot of, uh, we tend to make a lot of samples, a lot of mock-ups, everything from materials and finishes to how something performs, how it functions. Uh, these, this research that we do is not only for the, our own studies, but also as a way to communicate with the clients and express our ideas. But it's also a way to begin to um, communicate things uh, to the people who will be making them. And so this image here on the left that you can see, uh, that's, you know my blue jeans here on the on the bottom left hand corner but this is the hand and the pencil and the scale of the carpenter and so we're working out this is a drawing that he's made for window details um, this is another carpenter who we're working with on a model for the school and so what's really i think interesting about the way that we approach the work is that by involving the people who will be making the project with us, physically constructing it at an earlier stage, we're able to be far more efficient, not only with our communication in terms of the number and the kind of drawings that we would need to make, but also to be able to tap into the kind of knowledge and uh, experience that, that these uh, really knowledgeable craftspeople have. And that doesn't necessarily just mean carpentry or masonry, um, but everyone from engineers and farmers and artists, people who in some way might be able to play a role in the, the making of the school and to involve them early on in the design process really gives them uh, a sort of a richer and more in-depth kind of investment. This is a project we were doing in the uh, mountains in the UAE between uh, Dubai and Oman and the what you can see here on the right is a model uh, of, of the house that we were planning to build it was going to be constructed in rammed earth and when we started to make the mock-ups on site the the sort of contractors and the builders that we were working with immediately started sort of talking about ideas about how it would be formed and how it would be made these two gentlemen had come from Afghanistan, and so they had ideas about how they would build with Cobb and how the spaces would be formed. And very quickly, a kind of impromptu design conversation broke out, and they started making their own model right there on the site. This is the kind of collaboration that we we really try and um, <coughs> excuse me that we really try and nurture in our uh, in our practice because it really leads to um, just far better results. 
So coming to the, the school, uh, I think this was in one of the slides that Deepa shared as well. This is uh, sort of midway through the process. The building that you can see here on the left is the first building that was constructed. Uh, the one on the right is the second one partway through. The one in the middle is the third. And there are actually one, two, and three more buildings that you'll see that have come up uh, consequently after, after this photo was taken. Um, but this, I wanted to start with this image because you can see the kind of the native landscape, what was there before, more or less a barren kind of hillside, a, a sort of gentle meadow, uh, but quite a sloping site, which was one thing that we needed to deal with in terms of how we occupied the space. Um, we also, uh, because this is a residential school, uh, the approach that we took in terms of uh, how the, the buildings themselves would be designed, we wanted to really uh, sort of challenge the normative campus uh, life that you see in a lot of uh, educational institutions in India, where they really separate the dormitory living from the academic buildings. And so if you look at each of the six buildings uh, when they're built, the lower two floors each have academic functions. Uh, so this is the library here on the bottom right. In the center, these are this is the kind of leadership center. So there's classrooms and offices here. This is the uh, science and technology entrepreneurial building. So here on the lower two levels, uh, which is behind this mound, there's classrooms. And then the upper floors of each of the two, or each of the six buildings rather, are dormitories. And we we arrange that in the master plan as a way to ensure that no place on campus uh, throughout the day, throughout the year, um, would be empty. And so all parts of the campus are used pretty much uh, throughout the day and night. And we wanted to avoid those kind of uh, dead zones. Um, before we started the work, one of the things that we came to realize very quickly on uh, was that the, the kind of careful use of resources, Again, because it's an NGO school, the budget was extremely tight. Um, we didn't have, uh, you know, any any extra uh, resources to spare. Everything from building materials to cost for labor to water, electricity, everything had to be utilized to its kind of maximum potential. Whatever we didn't fit into the budget meant that it didn't get built. It wasn't uh, accomplished. So however much building we had when the money ran out was what we would be left with. And so we took that challenge very seriously. And, and you'll see as we go through the process, and I, I show some of the images, how that's informed the design. Uh, so in terms of occupying the site, um, the first critical resource that we really studied was, was the use of water. There was an existing um, excavation on site that had a natural artesian well. And so one of the things that we did very early on was to uh, kind of formalize that well, to make it one, to protect that resource, to make it safe uh, for, for the students, but to also um, understand and be able to study how that water changed throughout the year, its availability, how much of it we could use, how we might uh, replenish and, and use recharge soak pits to, to replenish those supplies. Um, and the image on the left you can see is the, the gentleman holding the pen is actually an, uh, a mason. Um, it's kind of an all-arounder. He, he uh, contributed to the bamboo screen, some of the carpentry, but he's also the expert who helped us design the well. He's speaking to the... Um, the project manager for the site, who is a young, uh, energetic person, quite knowledgeable, but a, a kind of academic knowledge. And the drawings that you see on his hand are the most important drawings that were used for the for the construction of this uh, this resource. Um, it was the dialogue that happened on site. It was the understanding of how those materials would be ordered and and arranged and placed and used. And so that became a really critical um, dialogue for the, again, this kind of life source for the for the school. Um, here you can see the, the campus plan. So the well that I had um, 
mentioned is here in the sort of bottom left center. The six buildings that you can see here, one, two, three, four, five, six. The initial photograph of the hillside is from the top of the screen looking down. So this was the building on the left. This was the one in the center. This was the, the one on the right. And all of these now, uh, all of these one, two, three, four, five, six have been, at least the structures of them are up. Uh, we're hoping to maybe later on uh, find some additional resources that will enable us to build a small gymnasium. Uh, this is intended to be a football pitch. Um, but again, what we had to really study initially was how do we use and maintain the, the resources that are there. So from the well, uh, we get uh, clean water that can be used, it can be filtered, and it, it's potable uh, once it is. But what we initially worked out was uh, a kind of filtration system for the gray water, uh, for the rainwater, in terms of how that moves throughout the site. So all of these contours were reshaped to kind of channel the water down to this edge. Uh, this is a polishing pond that, if I work my way backwards, is topped up and refilled by the reed bed filtration system. So here, these lines that you see here, here for these two buildings, here for these two buildings. These are our natural reed bed uh, filters. So all of the black water coming uh, out of the, the toilets and the gray water coming out of the sinks and showers enters into these chambers. It's naturally filtered by, uh, by plants, cannas and alocasia. And that water then overflows and it goes through a secondary filter and then it ends up in this polishing pond that is at the lowest point. Uh, the, there's an 18 meter slope from the top corner of the site down to the bottom. And, oops, if I go back, sorry. Uh, this, the gray water, or sorry, the water that goes through these filters passes through a charcoal filter and is discharged into this pond. That water is uh, further UV filtered by the sun and then is pumped up to the topmost corner of the site and goes through, passes through a series of aqueducts that we've established. This is a very traditional uh, kind of agrarian technique to water the landscape. It's used for coconut plantations, for uh, different kinds of uh, paddy fields. Obviously, our land is too steep for paddy, but we've implemented these. You saw in the previous drawing, there's a network of, of channels and waterways that are used to take that reclaimed water uh, and provide it to the, the landscape of the school. 100% of the water used for the landscape comes from the water that comes out of the drains, uh, basically the, the wastewater that is produced by the occupants and the community of the school itself. So we're quite proud of that. Um, getting into the, the design of the buildings themselves, one of the things that we realized very early on as well is that most of these young women would be living away from home for the first time. And so what we wanted to do was to create, uh, while this is an institution and it is an in, they are institutional buildings, we wanted to create a greater number of smaller buildings where the students would feel more comfortable. Uh, so while we did have to use you know, reinforced concrete as a kind of affordable uh, building material to, to build kind of at the scale that we are at, what we tried to do was to, not just with the scale, but also with the materiality, to try and reduce the kind of institutional feeling of it and, and create spaces that were much more domestic. And we realized as well that the, the kind of, um, the, the heart and the soul of the school would actually be the spaces in between the spaces. So there are classrooms, there are dormitories, but the, the places where girls would gather, they would tell secrets to each other, they would get additional help from teachers, they would make friends, they would run around and play, they would have after school dance classes. 
those things would be the verandas, the passages, the staircases. And so we really tried to create these kind of intimate moments, these kind of spaces in between spaces where the girls could have a bit more freedom of movement. They were unstructured, they were un, uh, you know, unprogrammed. And so it was really for them to find their own way to, to kind of occupy these, these spaces in between. Um, I think another thing that was really critical, again, because of our, our craft-based approach and the materials that we uh, were, were quite passionate about using, um, we, we focused, again, the concrete was a kind of means to an end. It enabled us to kind of cover the size and space and shape and form that we needed. But when it came to the kind of articulation and the infill and the materials that people would use and touch. Um, so the, the primary wall partition, you can see here on the top right, these are fly ash uh, uh, blocks. They're made from uh, fly ash wastage that comes, so they're, it's a recycled material that comes from uh, industrial waste. Uh, they're lightweight. Uh, they're fairly good both thermally and acoustically. And again, because of the budget, we made the, the conscious decision not to plaster them. So they have a very light uh, kind of cement screed wash on them. Um, the material here for the cubbies that you can see um, <clears throat> is a very inexpensive uh, marble that comes from Rajasthan. Um, we realized in the kind of analysis of things that if we were to build plywood cupboards in front of uh the walls that it would actually be more expensive than using this this natural stone material uh and then obviously the stone has a, a beauty to it it has a practicality to it it's more hygienic it's more durable uh it's less susceptible to vandalism all of those kinds of things and so for us uh really using the economy of means and the uh the budget to kind of drive our material choices was a really strong um, kind of value system that was overlaid onto the project. Again, the use of mock-ups, um, these, are, these are the kind of samples and tests. Uh, this is, you know, again, the kind of attention that we tried to give into sourcing the material. Um, you can see here, all of the doors are reclaimed. So they're actually old Burma teakwood from, uh, taken from abandoned buildings. The 80 doors in the initial purchase that we made for the first building actually came from a school as well. Again, um, it was value driven. These effectively came to roughly the same cost as brand new doors uh, and windows, but the brand new doors and windows would be made out of, you know, uh, modern materials, synthetic materials, things that would not have the lifespan that would not have the durability then, and that obviously would not have the kind of experiential and, and tactile qualities that uh, something like a natural material like wood uh, enables. Um, I've got this, this sort of quote here that I'd found actually earlier today that I wanted to share and it talks about tacit knowledge. Uh, it says tacit knowledge is rooted in context in experience, in the practice and values. It is difficult to communicate. It resides in the mind of the practitioner and is passed on through socialization and mentoring. I think I've got a typo there, but I think what's so powerful for me about that and, and how that relates specifically to this project is that we really relied heavily because of the, again, the, the budget constraints, but also because of the resources that we have in terms of the people that we collaborate with, we we rely heavily on their experience, on their tacit knowledge, and the things that they can contribute to it are immeasurable. One example of that is um, is the stone paving, um, and you'll see examples of that in the coming slides. But this image, this black and white image here on the left, is is a very famous paving done by an architect in Greece. Um, and I was really inspired by it and I brought it to my mason and I said, can we achieve 
something like this and how can we do it in the budget it's so carefully done and so carefully laid and out of that conversation he he started talking about places where we could go to quarries and we could go to shops and we could get salvaged material broken pieces literally broken pieces that nobody wanted and that we could pick them up for basically the cost of transportation so what you see here on the bottom this paving all of that is made from wastage it's broken pieces of kota and kadapa and salvaged pieces of granite and basically these off cuts things that people no longer wanted we were able to pick them up basically again for the cost of transportation and with a little bit more investment in in terms of in labor uh, we were able to achieve this uh, incredible pattern this incredible mosaic there's no drawing for this there's no i've not sit you know i didn't sit and make a drawing either a sketch or a, an autocad drawing nothing so this comes out of this dialogue that we have with the the people the artisans that we work with and <clears throat> it really for me is such a powerful um narrative in terms of the kind of uh, knowledge sharing that can come out of a collaborative process. I think um, maybe what I'll do at this point uh, is pause for a second and and people, are, are, first of all, are you able to, is everyone able to hear me and has it come across clearly? Yeah, absolutely. We can hear you very clearly and it was really Thanks. interesting to learn about uh, you know the whole design approach and your collaboration with the local um, craftsmen and uh, really you know resources literally local resources in terms of, in terms of even materials and the choice and uh, you know how you went about even selecting the materials and applying them i'm really uh, curious to know uh, what was the brief uh, given to you uh, from the client <laughs> that's a great question the the one um the one thing that really stands out in my mind from the brief was that she wanted us to create a sanctuary for learning that was the term that she used over and over that a lot of these as i mentioned before most of these young women it's the first time that they're living away from home and she really wanted to create a space of of not just sharing of knowledge, but really a community and a, a, a place that um, they could find a, a sense of tranquility, they could bond with each other because while the learning obviously comes from teachers and books and studies and things like that, a lot of it also comes from their relationships with each other. And so I think there's a lot of uh, peer learning that happens uh, in this place. And the young women that, that attend the school are, are really just this overwhelming life force um and so in terms of you know practically the brief the they asked us to um they asked us for more square footage than we could actually provide given the fsi which is actually another reason uh that i i probably forgot to mention for the verandas the verandas are considered only a fraction of the fsi so the and I'll get into how they impact the passive cooling in a little bit, but um, the verandas help us save a little bit of FSI, uh, but they also, um, they just create these, these additional learning spaces, as I mentioned, social spaces, secondary academic uh, places right. for play and things like that. So it was to really try and maximize the, the footprint that we could build. Right. Um, yeah, I think that that was that worked for you, the the exercise part. Uh, and uh, yeah, so at this point, I just wanted to um, take a pause and just understand the you know where it started and how it started. And uh, now I, I'm sure uh, we are all of us are really curious to know how this building, you know, the form and the way you uh, treated the facade, uh, how all of that has come into play. So we will move on and uh, let's understand that bit. Okay. Yeah. Sure, no problem. 
So <clears throat> as I mentioned, the, the kind of reality of local building technologies and, um, you know, material uh, implications of the kind of uh, context of the, of the region almost dictated that that reinforced concrete and specifically cast in place reinforced concrete would kind of drive the the space making. Um, and so we've always thought of these um, these structures as intelligent, dumb boxes. <laughs> so they're really um, they're really simple in their form. Uh, it's it's a very basic kind of column grid. It's uh, square and round columns arranged on a, a rectangular plan. Um, and then uh, post-tension pre-stressed uh, slabs to help us reduce the number of columns that we would require internally. But again, a, still a very, very simple uh, concrete form. The one um, uh, thing that I think is is interesting is that uh, in the same way that we like to collaborate with, with the craftsmen, we started uh, very early on in the process uh, with a, a climate engineer named Pratik Raval, who was the lead engineer uh, for Transolar Climate Engineers based out of New York. Uh, they also have an office in, in Frankfurt in Germany, but we were working specifically with Pratik in New York. And very early on in the process, once we had started to formalize the language of the building, he had suggested this idea of solar chimneys and in combination with earth ducts. And so basically the very simple way that a solar chimney works is that on the uh, facing the, the south, obviously the sun. So the sun shines onto these uh glass basically greenhouse structures that that exist on the roof on the north side of that structure so three sides are glass and on the north side is a, a kind of thermal mass of of concrete um, it's basically a five meter high vertical wall and the idea is that as the sun shines through that glass and heats up the concrete slab that air expands and creates a convection and that convection is released through these louvered grills on the top um, and what that convection does is that sucks air out of this vertical shaft that goes right through the core of each and every building and so what we've done in in if you see in this section these top small rooms here so this is a dormitory this is a dorm these four are the dormitories these are outdoor verandas here on this side so the 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 residential spaces are set quite far back from the edge which again this becomes a social space on the on the open verandas but also protects and shades the rooms themselves to to further stay cool um and then again here on the classroom side which again on we tried as much as possible to keep the classrooms on the north side to protect it from direct sunlight and at the ceiling level of each of these spaces, we've got an open grill that releases the hot air that's rising through convection and releasing out the top of the solar chimney. Now, the supply air, the, the cool air, um, can obviously come in through open windows, through open doorways, uh, which is what we've utilized at the dormitory levels. But in the lower levels where you have a much higher occupancy in terms of number of people occupying a given space, what we wanted to do also was to uh, provide what we call these earth ducts. You can see here these, these earth ducts are made up of, of large uh, 900 millimeter diameter concrete hume pipes. They're laid in between the foundations of the building and what we've done is that if you imagine the section of this this is the right hand side is the uphill side the left hand is downhill so this veranda here on the ground floor leaves out at grade but here on the downhill side you've got a sort of small raised plinth which i'll show in, in uh, the subsequent images but what that does is that it allows us to bring in cool air uh, already cooler air because it's from the shaded side of the building we're able to put trees and plants to further cool it and to add a small amount of humidity. 
that air passes underneath the building. It actually goes underneath and then comes back. So it goes into the core of the building, which further cools it because obviously the temperature below ground uh, beneath the building is cooler. And then it passes back towards the outside and then it raises up and comes in at the floor level of each of the classrooms. Now, in the classrooms, obviously, if you're releasing cool air in at the floor level, it's going to eventually mix with the students and movement and conversation and breathing and perspiration. And that uh, air is going to then, as it heats up, it will rise to the ceiling and it will be released out through the, the ceiling there. So this completely eliminates the need for any kind of uh, mechanical uh, air conditioning. Um, which is obviously not only uh, a savings in terms of uh, cost of implementation, but uh, obviously the long-term energy use and maintenance, repairs, uh, all of those kinds of things. Um, the, all of this was designed by Pratik in collaboration with our team. And as soon as we had the kind of conceptual idea of the chimneys married to the developing form of the building, we shipped, uh, not shipped, we emailed the, the 3D models of the building that we were making to Pratik. He was then able to enter that into the, um, the climate data map in terms of precipitation, in terms of uh, the ambient air temperatures, humidity, wind direction, uh, solar angles, all of those things for the specific site that we were occupying and the, the nearest weather station, which was in uh, just a matter of kilometers away from, from where we were. And he was able to tell us on any given day, at any given point of time in that day what the ambient temperature in each of these spaces would be based on how many people would be occupying it, what the anticipated weather that day was. So there was a tremendous amount of um, modeling that went on uh, to, to kind of predict and anticipate what these things were, but then also to, uh, to test it once we had kind of formalized. Now, obviously, because we have reduced the amount of energy being used for things especially like air conditioning. Um, we also, all of the electrical in the rooms, or all of the lighting, sorry, is with LED tubes. The only kind of mechanical anything in terms of uh, cooling that we have are, are very simple box standard ceiling fans. And so what that also enabled us to do was to greatly reduce the energy consumption required for electricity. 85% uh, of the school's uh, power is provided by uh, photovoltaic cells that are placed on the rooftop of each of these buildings. Uh, the pieces that you see here, so on the bottom right, you can see the, the PV cells, the sort of taller, um, Structures you see across the middle, these are solar water heaters, which provide all of the hot water uh, required for, for the dormitories, for the bathrooms, uh, for the teacher housing, all of those things. And then behind that, you can see a sort of more detailed image of each of the solar chimneys. So each building has either two or three of these, depending on size, orientation, each of those things. Um, but this is these are what provide the, the primary cooling. You can see here in the classroom, um, the, uh, the, these are the LED tubes that I was mentioning. Again, very, very simple uh, features, the ceiling fans. And <clears throat> one of the things that I think was really critical to, to the success of it was that the conversations we we're having with Pratik was that at every turn, we tried to think of the the building and the campus as a kind of holistic environment and so what uh i think is so successful about the, the part of the reason and the technical and practical reason that the solar chimneys work is the thermal mass that is created and the thermal lag that is created by the the mass of the exposed stone floors and the exposed exposed concrete ceilings so on the one hand, 
we not only needed to save money um, by stripping away finishes and paint and every other um, kind of non-essential item that we could, but having the ceilings be exposed concrete slabs was actually helpful to our, our cooling system as well. And the mosaic floors, which you'll see in a second, um, also contributed to that. So this is an example of the, again, you can see the, uh, the solar chimney here. The bamboo screen, which I'll come to a little bit later, helped with, uh, with, some, of this, with some of the solar shading as well. So this, this mosaic floor, again, the same principle as, as the paving outdoors. Um, we took, these are all different kinds of marble that come from different villages in Rajasthan. Again, we, we picked it up basically for the cost of transport. Um, and by investing a little bit more in the, the kind of artisan uh, craftsmanship of, of how these things were, were laid, um, enabled us to give a kind of unique quality to each of the spaces. But again, it's, it's performative as well. And so this is an, a critical component. If you have carpeting, if you have false ceilings, then the system itself uh, ceases, ceases to work. You can see here the, the color, which I'll come to in a second as well. We collaborated with a, an artist from, uh, from Copenhagen. Her name is Malena Bach. And she basically uh, came, uh, volunteered her time to, to work with us and, and, and for the school. Um, and the colors that she used all come from the natural pigments of India, their, their mineral oxides, um, their, their different, uh, different natural pigments. Um, and so the, all of the ceilings and her, her kind of um, artistic contribution aside from creating the colors themselves was the, the suggestion that we leave the walls more or less bare, but that we treat each of the ceilings in response to the program the relationship to the landscape, the, the, what the functions of each space would be. And so she has created a, a unique palette for each of the six buildings um, and then worked with, again, the, the artisans and the craftspeople who would be making these things. This is a little bit of her research. It's a mixture of uh, powdered pigment, cement, water, and uh, a binder that, she, that again, she developed and, and tested. Um, for us, it was also important to use recycled materials. So this is a, a kind of terrazzo uh, that we developed out of recycled glass. You can see the uh, the green here is from wine bottles. This turquoise blue is Bombay sapphire. There's you know different kinds of uh, different glass uh, enabled us to kind of create this unique palette, and then that translated into some of the the furniture of the, the space. This is a, a large work, uh, group work table in the library. I, again, you can see the marble, the simple concrete structure, Malena's color here on the ceiling. This is one of the, the grills, one of the exhaust grills for the solar chimney in the library space. So just again, a very simple uh, aluminum grill that allows the, the air to exhaust. And the the bamboo screens that I'd mentioned, these are some of our initial studies. This is, uh, these are mock-ups that we'd made. Again, we coordinated with, uh, not just with Pratik, who uh, informed us about how the implications of each of these on daylighting conditions in the space, in the classroom spaces, but also in the, um, uh, the dormitory spaces, the verandas. So how the density of the screens, you can see here, we're looking at different patterns, different density. Uh, this one here on the left is far more dense. This one is far less, uh, but also how that would be impacted by the monsoon. And so obviously the monsoon uh, on this site comes from the Southwest. And so places that have exposed passages, staircases, the, the density for each of the spaces varies on a number of parameters. It's, it's based on obviously the rains, the wind, uh, but, but most critically perhaps is, is the intensity of daylighting and how that needs to protect each of the, the various spaces. 
again, we worked with local craftsmen. This is the same gentleman who was drawing the well for us earlier, Malakar Mama. Um, and we developed these, these techniques of tying. Uh, again, we're not inventing anything new. This is uh, simply a kind of artistic expression related to uh, what we hope to, to create in terms of experience. But not only experience, uh, but a, a kind of technical, practical resolution that that enabled the, the kind of useful um, uh, inhabitation of the school uh, and would meet the problems of the community in a, in a very uh, simple but hopefully thoughtful way. Um, so this is uh, this is it. This this photo is maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, the the buildings continue to come up. Um, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we've got uh, all six of the structures are up now. We're hoping in the next year to finish the interiors of the of the remaining two. Um, but the the school has currently has about three hundred students, and they'll be adding another hundred or so in June. Maximum occupancy is going to be around six or seven hundred young women, and so um, we're quite proud of, of the kind of impact that this has made, not just on the community, but uh, the the women and the families of of these young girls who uh, are really creating a unique opportunity for themselves. I think uh, that's the last slide, uh, and I can certainly open it up now to, to any questions that anyone might have. Yes, sure. In fact, there are a lot of questions. So uh, um, you know, let's <laughs> okay. start taking them uh, one by one. Uh, the first question, sure. um, is there a reasoning behind the placement of the bamboo lures? Uh, yes, I, I, I tried to uh, answer that. We, to some degree, it is slightly graphical uh, in terms of its its expression as a facade, but primarily it's to to provide a sense of shade. And so, obviously, there's there's less density on the north side. There's more density on the south side. In the southwest, where the where the monsoon rains come, we had not only more screens but a denser pattern of screens. It's a little hard to see in this photograph, but there are three different densities um, for each of the screens, and then how they're placed is uh, is based uh, loosely on on what kind of performance was required. Okay, next one. Uh, how is the uh, purification of water? I am guessing this is filtration of water. Uh, done, which you've explained, but does does the filtered water carry uh, any odor? So there's two kinds of filtered water. One, the, they take water from the well, which is uh, sort of initially naturally filtered through the groundwater. And then if they need that to be uh, drinking water, then they, uh, they filter that with a reverse osmosis system. Um, and the gray water is filtered through the reed bed system that I'd mentioned before. And by the time it goes through uh, the, the, the various chambers of the reed bed, the, uh, the charcoal filter and the sand filter that's there, it's then discharged into the polishing pond. By, by the time it reaches that stage, there is no longer any, any odor. This is not, uh, again, it's not a new technology. It's something that is becoming, um, uh, I hope, more and more popular. Um, the downside to it is that it does take up a little bit more space. So it's less suited to a more urban environment. But in a campus context like this, where we have enough landscape to be able to sustain it, it was a perfect a uh, solution for the amount of water that we, we wanted to uh, harvest and, and reuse. Okay, next one. Was the idea of a high performance building explicit in the brief? Something that the client wanted from the beginning or was it a consequence of a smart and sensible design? 
it was not something that they uh, specifically asked for. They did express uh, wherever possible uh, environmental, uh, environmentally conscious solutions, but it wasn't uh, designated in a more specific or, or thoroughly required way than that. Uh, I, I think they were very supportive of it when we pushed to to achieve these kind of results. And I think the biggest, uh, you know, initial uh, evidence of that support was was getting Pratik and Transolar on board. They were very supportive of that idea. They went and met him in New York, um, and it was uh, a very clear. There was a very clear synergy, and it was very clear the value that that kind of uh, not just engineering, but kind of holistic thinking could contribute to the architecture. But that was something that uh, we we drove as as sort of leaders of the band, I would say. Great. Next one. Um, next question is: Can you please highlight the the length of the underground air tunnel before it enters the enters the area below Clint Channel? And how do you prevent uh, microorganisms from entering the spaces along with the cool air? So this distance from here to here is about eight meters. So it travels, it travels eight meters, it then turns around in a chamber and it goes eight meters back. Um, so if I look at these pipes here, it goes in one side and then it goes through a chamber and goes back the other side and then it comes out into the classroom. So by the time it's entered the building until it gets into the classroom, it's gone about 16 meters or so. Um, and on the outside, trying to see if I've got a picture. Well, the good thing is, is that you can, in this picture here, behind all of these plants is where those uh, earth ducts come in. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a picture. But to answer the, the question about, um, you know, pests and rodents and things like that, we have a metal louvered grill that's similar to the louvers that are here on top. And then inside of that, we have a smaller metal mosquito mesh that keeps, you know, uh, flies and mosquitoes from entering the, the space. But those are all removable. We wanted, we also made sure that the ducts were large enough that a person could crawl into them if need be. Uh, they're obviously sealed off so that nobody does without invitation. But uh, they're all uh, maintainable. If something were to get inside, they can be opened up and, and cleaned out. Right. Next question. Uh, what's uh, approximate temperature difference, like air, air temperature difference between outside and inside the spaces? So depending on which day it is and where you measure it from, we've, we have recorded temperatures a temperature difference as much as nine degrees, which is vast, but typically it'll be anywhere from kind of three to five degrees from the, let's say the classroom space to the space immediately outdoors. Um, again, it, it so temperature is one, one of the things I learned very early on from Pratik is that temperature is one uh, measure of comfort. The others are the amount of clothes that you have on, in terms of the kind of density and your ability to to kind of perspire and and have that uh, evaporation, uh, the second is the relative humidity, the third is temperature, and the fourth is air movement. And so the the success of the system, while it does achieve a kind of five to nine degree temperature difference, um, it's also based on the air flow and the air movement that is created. Uh, by the convection, not just the temperature alone. Absolutely. So it's just temperature is never the only indicator of uh, comfort. Um, next exactly. question. Yeah. Next question is uh, how is the sound transmission from solar chimneys from one space to the another managed? 
<laughs> that's a great question. Um, uh, not as well as we would like. Um, we proposed um, lining the ducts with sound dampening acoustical panels. And unfortunately, because of the, the cost implications of that, we weren't able to afford them. Um, the girls in the dormitories have realized that they're able to kind of get into their bunk beds and whisper to their friends uh, on, on the opposite side of the wall and, and kind of convey messages that way. Um, we, have, we have managed to put in uh, very simple kind of baffles that, that more or less keep the classroom noise from going from one classroom to another. Um, I would say the larger uh, issue, the larger acoustical issue, if I'm being very honest, uh, is the acoustics of the room by having so much hard surface uh, rather than the transfer from space to space. Um, the Because of the thermal mass of the floor and the thermal mass of the ceiling and keeping those uh, largely open, um, again, we, we've proposed uh, acoustical treatments for those for those spaces, it is possible, uh, but the budget at the moment has not has not permitted us to implement them. Okay, um, interesting way to send messages. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yes. Next question. Um, there's so many of them, and they're kind of repetitive, so we're trying to uh, pick the one that has not been uh, answered yet. Um, does the how does the dark color on the solar chimney uh, affect its enhance its performance? The the color on the on the walls. Yes. Um, I don't know how much it's the the color of it. Um, we we I asked that uh, that question, and the response that that Pratik gave us was that more than than the color itself, it, it was more the the thickness and the thermal qualities of the concrete. And so he enabled us the the color that we've applied in this image is more to do with the kind of uh, experience of the buildings uh, from the distant landscape um, and less to do with the kind of technical uh, viability of it. Um, but the information we got was that uh, it's more the material properties of the, of the wall than, than the color of it. Uh, right. And one last question here. Um, how are the pipes, I mean, do the pipes beneath the ground need to be cleaned? Maybe it's coming from a building. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I suspect that they, you know, that if we were to go down there, they'd be quite dusty. Um, I don't know, uh, the, the first building's been in operation now for, for three years. Um, and they may, uh, it's a, I, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. Um, the, as I mentioned, the grills are removable. They can be cleaned. Um, I suspect what they do more than anything is that they clean the grills and they clean the space in the classroom more than the, the ducts themselves. Hello? Right, yeah, we can hear you. I just oh. went Okay, my... something just changed, just changed the list. Okay, sorry. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure if they if they ever have cleaned those or if it's been a problem for them. Great. I think that was uh, pretty much all the questions uh, that we could take uh, right now. And uh, with that, uh, we come to the end of this webinar. I uh, thank you, Sam, so much for your time. And uh, with such clarity, you explain to us the process uh, and the way this building has taken shape. I really like how, you know, uh, simplicity uh, can be, can, can also, it's not just about functional uh, aspect, but there's so much thought that goes into it. And um, even if there's a, uh, I, I don't think everything is driven by budget over here, looking at how you've explained uh, the process. 
but just simple buildings like this can uh, be wonderful uh, to the client, to the people inhabiting the building, and of course on the planet. So it's the three P's, people, planet, and prosperity. And uh, this is a great example of that. Uh, thank you once again. And before I wrap up, I have a few announcements uh, to make. Uh, on 23rd, two weeks from now, we have the next webinar on a very different and interesting topic. It's about how to tell your high performance story. Designing is one and talking about it and communicating it with effective and uh, meaningful graphics to the client and other team members is another thing. And how do you do that? Talking about that will be <clears throat> Project Stasio team of three uh, experts. Uh, it's, it's a website with crowdfunded uh, graphics and uh, tune in on 23rd to learn more about it. And if you already do not know, we have all the webinar recordings available on our YouTube channel, NZ India. If you've uh, missed any of our past webinars, you can uh, you know, go back to the channel and listen in to about 20 odd topics that we have covered uh, last year. To know more about our initiatives, subscribe to our monthly newsletter, the NZ Times, and uh, you will get all the information about the NZEP initiatives in India and globally. And to get that, please sign up on our website, nzep.in today and connect with us on social media for all the other updates. And until then, I will see you next, on, next to next week on 23rd. Thank you so much for your time and attention and interest. Thank you. Thank you.